Am I letting people in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to Hampstead Synagogue, or more accurately, Hampstead Synagogue Online. Uh, we're just going to allow people to make their way into the room, but yeah, get a bit comfortable. And uh, just to explain that once again, we here are in the Zoom room, and uh, we're live broadcasting on all different parts of the uh, social media spectrum. So uh, if you're watching us on those feeds, a warm welcome to you. Um, I think I can hear myself. I don't know quite how. So if we can mute everybody, that would be very helpful. Um, and as I said, so we are actually live streaming this on social media across the world. So I might give a little bit more context to those people who uh, may not be uh, watching from this country or indeed from the Jewish community. So welcome to everybody. Just to remind everybody in the Zoom room that uh, you can use the uh, chat facility uh, to put your question to our guest this evening. And uh, you will have the right to go uh, face to camera. This can't be done, of course, if you're watching on Twitter, or on YouTube or Facebook, uh, but we will be monitoring uh, what you're saying and uh, put your questions to our guest uh, during the meeting. There's a lot of people involved, interested in tonight's event as they were in our last session, so it might not be possible to come to everybody's question, and so what we'll do in that scenario is try to get a theme together and put that theme to our guest. So uh, people are just making themselves comfortable here in the Zoom room, and we're seeing that there's a lot of people uh, joining us on the social media platforms. A warm welcome to you. This is a live event, uh, so uh, as the saying goes, please do not swear. I don't think I need to tell this audience. We're going to, I just want to uh, give a, a little bit of a warning to those uh, who got an invitation through the Hampstead Synagogue. Uh, we did give you a phone number to ring, just an ordinary phone number. If you wanted to join us just by phone, not a mobile phone or anything, I should uh, point out that that is not a toll free number. Uh, that is not a free number, so just be, be aware of that. Um, it's not a premium number either, but uh, you, you do need to know that. Uh, if the uh, facility, by the way, to have a Zoom toll-free number costs a thousand pounds a month, so uh, donations for that would be very much appreciated. www.hampstedshaw.org.uk um, and uh, maybe next session we'll have a toll-free number as well. We're just letting people in the room to settle down and uh, we'll start in a, in a few minutes. A lot of people still trying to get their connections working and uh, all looking good. For those of you who are watching on uh, social media might not be aware, but this is uh, a picture of the Hampstead Synagogue. And uh, this is where we normally reside, but uh, this is the Hampstead Synagogue online tonight. We very much hope to be back in the synagogue uh, shortly um, and uh, plans are afoot. I was thinking that maybe we would have a, a kind of town hall meeting to discuss how we actually reopen the shul and have a discussion with our members to see uh, how they feel about that. Some people might think that's a bit too early. Uh, others very excited to get back. Um, I was speaking to Australia earlier today and <coughs> They were saying that as far as they were concerned, it was all locked down for two weeks and that was it. They were very much spared this uh, pandemic. So that was uh, interesting to hear. I think um, I can see somebody still tr tr struggling to, for a connection. I'm going to give them a little bit of time to, to settle in and then we'll, we'll get started. Just a, a reminder for those who have joined us here on Zoom, at any point in the meeting, if you go into the chat facility, uh, just click on the screen and go to the menu and you should see either a uh, speech bubble or the word chat. If you click on that and then you type in a question, uh, ho hopefully we'll come to you uh, later on and you can put your question face to camera to our guest speaker. For those on uh, social media who are still joining us all over the place, well, welcome to you. 
Uh, we'll be monitoring what you say in your chat or messaging services. And uh, if you ask a question there, we'll try to put that question to our guest speaker here in the Zoom room. Still an opportunity to uh, view the previous sessions. Um, Marie van der Zyl was first, the president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, and then uh, Stephen Pollard, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle. I think that we're ready to go now. Um, and uh, I think I got some thumbs up. So I think uh, we'll start the evening, the more formal part of the evening. And uh, to just to give you a little bit of context for those of you, of you watching overseas, perhaps on Facebook or on Twitter and all the rest of it. Um, let me just tell you that Hampstead Synagogue is an Orthodox community based in London, England. Uh, we were founded in 1892 and still operate from our original building, one of the so-called cathedral synagogues of the United Kingdom. Our parent organization is the United Synagogue. Uh, tonight, we would like to thank uh, Adrian Powell for making this possible. Haley in the office, and uh, I'm just, uh, I have to do everything here. I'm admitting people at the same time. Haley in the office, and Amanda and Madeline behind the scenes. Uh, just to remind you that our media partner is the Jewish Chronicle, and you can find them at thejc.com, and it's a good place to find out what's going on in the Jewish community here and overseas. Uh, technical support is being provided by Shock Audio Visual, and you can find them at uh, www.shockaudio-visual.co.uk. And uh, thanks very much to Leo Mindell and the team. Um, my name is Gabriel Herman, and together with Madeleine Abramson, who you'll be meeting later in the meeting, we are the co-chairs of the Hampstead Synagogue. And for those of you who are monitoring my sartorial choices, uh, you'll remember that on the first session I wore black tie and I said to you, well, when is, when is the next time I'm going to have the opportunity to wear it? Uh, last time I wore a jacket and tie. Now I'm wearing a jacket without a tie. And I did promise you by the end of this series, I'd probably be wearing a T-shirt like everybody else. Uh, and if you would like to uh, uh, give some choices to what T-shirt I should wear, please do send them in. And uh, by the rate I'm going at the moment, um, I was extra, extra large. I think I'm now extra large. And by the time we finish, I might have shrunk even further. Uh, that's what a healthy diet does for you. But there we are. OK, um, I'd like to now, if I may, introduce our guest uh, speaker. Uh, Jonathan Goldstein is the chairman of the Jewish Leadership Council, JLC, the umbrella body of British uh, juries central organizations and charities. He assumed the role in April 2017 and was re-elected to a second term only very recently. During his tenure, the JLC has launched a number of key initiatives, including the Community Wellbeing Project designed to address mental health issues amongst children and young people, a commission into the long-term needs of adult social care and he has led a series of collaborative efforts to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Since March 2018, when he called for and led the Enough is Enough rally outside the UK Parliament, Jonathan has been at the forefront of the community's efforts to hold the Labour Party to account for its failure to tackle anti-Semitism. Jonathan is also the chair of the Chief Rabinet Trust and with his wife, president of Camp Simcha. Camp Simcha has been a vital frontline service for families struggling with vulnerable, seriously ill children. And if you need that service, I can give you the phone number now, 020-8202-9297. And the next part in our series will be a panel of guests specifically looking at the Jewish Family Unit, and we'll give you more details about that later. In his day job, Jonathan is the chief executive and co-founder of Kane International, a privately held real estate investment firm operating in Europe and the United States. Since 2014, the firm has invested over $5.8 billion in real estate debt and equity, as well as lifestyle and leisure businesses that deliver experiences, services, 
and amenities for modern consumers. Okay, Jonathan, over to you. Well, thank you, Gabriel. Um, thank you for that introduction and thank you for everybody for joining tonight. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's nice to see some friendly faces on the screen. Although I have to say, seeing faces on the screen is nothing like seeing people in person. And those of us who seem to be desperate to get back to our normal lives uh, will hope that we are in the final stages of what's been a very, very difficult time for the world, for the country and for our community. Uh, I've been home now for a hundred days. So I think I know how a lot of people feel. By way of backdrop for tonight, I want to speak for 15 or so minutes and, and, and try and use the question, where are we now, which was the heading that I was given, to try and cut that down into three areas, which is what does community mean and how does community stand in the context of, of the corona uh, time, but also more generally? Secondly, what has been done to address the pandemic within the community and what needs to be done? And then maybe in the questions and answers, which I look forward to later, um, we can talk about what it means for the future. I'm happy, of course, as well, to talk about any other issues which you feel are, are relevant, anything to do with the, the, the political world and the political environment, which we've all been engaged for so long. But let me just say again how honoured I am to be given this opportunity by Hampstead Shaw and uh, to thank you all for joining tonight. So I mentioned that I've been at home for 100 days and uh, I actually had COVID myself at the beginning of March. And it's been a time of real contemplation. And as some of you may know, uh, some of you know who I know on this call, um, it's also been a time when we have suffered as a family, like many, many other families within the community and like many, many other people in the country and around the world because uh, we lost my father, Sir Colonel Livrocker, at the end of March. And what that 100 days has done is made me think about what does community mean? What does community stand for? What should we be doing in context to our interactions with the community? Because we should be spending this time, using this time positively to assess and analyze how we engage with the community and how best we can invigorate our community going forward. And one of the great things we've seen has been the the, the great energy across the community, across, uh, across the entire spectrum of the community, all the religious denominations engaging so aggressively with their, with their community online, the social care organizations engaging in the most extraordinary way with people who've needed them at times of extreme need, and people stepping up to the plate and being great balsa dockers, both in terms of actness, actness uh, uh, great acts of chesed, and also where they can and where they're able to do so to be financially supportive to organizations who have suffered uh, need and support in a way in which we could never have imagined. And what I want to do to start with, if someone could put my presentation up, is to frame my conversation in relation to what I believe we should do with the community. And I'm no rabbi, I warn you all of that, is to frame that around I, a bit of Pirkei Avot, a bit of Pirkei uh, Ethics of Our Fathers, we go to the next slide because one of the things that we as a family have tried to answer um, since my father passed and as most of you will know that my brother is, is the uh, president in our synagogue my younger brother made aliyah to israel and you know we're very proud because uh, we have our first member of the family who is actually serving currently in sahal so we pray for asha's safety and, and good health at all times so one of the questions we're asked is, well, what did your parents get right? Not that we're any good, Michael or I or Daniel, because we're probably very poor at what we do, but clearly we have a sense of community. And what I want to talk about is how do we instill that sense of community in, in many others? And what did maybe my parents get right that we can learn from and, and get right across the whole community and spend this time when we've actually got downtime with our families and with our wider networks in our communities to engage with our community. So I'm going to take these five lines very quickly of Pirkei Avot, and I'll just do the English. And there's five or six little lessons in here which I'd like to instill, which come back to leadership, come back to values and virtues that I believe in myself, and which I hope to aspire and, 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 and live by, and which I think we could all benefit from in terms of our engagement with the community. So Hillel said, do not separate yourself from the community. So, so what does that mean? 
And what it means is what we're doing tonight and what it means is what we've done over the period of the last few months. We have engaged with our community and with each other in ways in which we have not done for years. We have become invigorated over the past three months, but I also argue since the time of the Enough Enough is, is Enough campaign, we have seen an invigorated and engaged Jewish community. As I've got older, I've realized it doesn't matter how Jews interact with the community. It doesn't matter through which religious denomination. It doesn't matter whether it's cultural, through art, through music, through sport. There are so many ways that we can attach ourselves to the community. And one of the great things about the JLC is the great variety of organizations, over 30 of them who we represent and who represent every facet of the connections with our community. There is no excuse for anybody to not find a point of connection to our community. There is every opportunity to get engaged, get involved and do acts of chesed and, 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 and kindness to others. The next two really talk about the way in which, or next three, the way in which we should be acting as human beings between each other. Do not trust in yourself until the day of your death. Now, what does that mean? And for me, that means forget what you've done yesterday. It's irrelevant. It genuinely is irrelevant that you may have done something good and you may have got an accolade for it and people may praise you. It only matters what you do tomorrow. It only is important what you're going to do tomorrow to engage with your community, engage with your fellow man and woman. Do not judge your fellow man until you've reached his place. Now, when I was younger, I actually thought that quote was from To Kill a Mockingbird because my favorite book when I grew up was To Kill a Mockingbird where Atticus Finch talks to his children and says, don't judge a man until you've walked in his shoes. Only later in life did I realize that our you know, forefathers had written that down very many, many, many years ago. Do not judge your fellow man until you've reached his place. You cannot walk in someone else's shoes. We've seen that in a way in, in, in not really understanding the racism that is in our society and the racism that so many people have suffered. And unfortunately, that's come to the fore with the George Floyd, George Floyd murder and the um, aftermath of that around the world. But one of the great things we should do is not to judge your fellow man until you've stood in his shoes or reached his place. One of the rabbis very kindly, when I became the chair of the JLC, bought me a pair of shoes, not realizing this was a phrase that meant so much to me. And they sit on my desk at work, reminding me at all times that it's not what I think, but always to look at it from the other person's perspective. Do not say something that can't be understood that in the end will be understood. Now, one of my faults is that I try to speak very directly. And this is what I think this says. It says, be gentle, be nice, but be honest with each other. Speak plainly and truthfully to people because we all have the same objective in life. And we should be look, working forward with common purpose collaboratively. And that's the way I've always tried to live my life, both in business terms, but also in communally, because we are not going to achieve anything if we um, live on our own, live as an island, and don't speak truthfully and honestly to people. And the final one I, I want to touch upon is to say, say not when I shall have leisure, I shall study, perhaps you will not have leisure. In other words, just stop putting off excuses as to why you cannot get involved. Because everybody has time, certainly in the last few months. Everybody has time. Everybody has 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day. Some people have an hour or two. Don't put off learning Torah. Don't put off getting engaged in the community. Don't put off making that commitment to third parties until tomorrow. Because as it says in our scripture, perhaps you will not have leisure tomorrow. Perhaps the pandemic maybe has taught all of us that to put off until tomorrow, what could have been done yesterday, might never happen. That there are always third party events that can intervene in our lives and ensure that we don't achieve what we should have achieved, that we don't maximize our potential, that we don't achieve for the community. So taking those principles as a whole, at the beginning of this crisis, I decided together with my colleagues at the JLC and together with our wonderful executive staff and as most of you will know, Simon Johnson was our wonderful chief executive for seven years and has now been taken over by two co-chief executives in Claudia Mendoza and Michelle James. And we said, you know what? Everything else can wait. Politics can wait. Everything else can wait. Let us engage in COVID in what we can do for the community in the course 
of this period because this opportunity, this situation is unique, it's unprecedented and may not repeat it. And we, you know, if we don't take the opportunity now, we can never have the opportunity. So I want to take you through some of the actions that we've been involved in um, since the beginning of that process. And if you could turn the page, the, the first page, the first situation before we get to the emergency community fund is that we facilitated the great appeal led by Jewish Care for Nightingale Hammerson and um, um, the Federation in Manchester, which raised a huge amount of money due to the wonderful generosity of our community. And that was the first time a collaborative, effectively small federated fundraising had occurred in our community. The second thing, which is what you see in front of you here is the emergency community fund. What we know, and anybody you know, who reads the newspapers, I'm sure understands, in April alone, Britain had a 20% drop in GDP. The Bank of England is projecting somewhere between an eight to 10% drop in GDP by the end of 2020. For those of you who know mathematics, the GDP of Britain is somewhere between 1.7 and 2 trillion. And if you work out what 10% of that, that's a very, very big number. People are going to suffer. And we knew that people, individual families in this community would not be able to put bread on the table for their families. People who maybe were self-employed, who didn't fulfill the criteria for the furlough scheme, people who had been made redundant immediately and did not have enough money to live off. So we immediately went to task and pulled together a hardship fund. And as you can see, we've given away over 350,000 pounds to 188 households. And you can see as well that that fund has supported living in various types of households in 65 different postcodes across the UK, Berkshire, Bristol, et cetera, et cetera. There are Jews in virtually every constituency in this country. And what we have seen is applications, hundreds of them, from all up and down the country, the length and breadth of the country. Now, I said to you, I mentioned the Jewish Care, wonderful campaign, but that still left, and Gabriel was very kind to say some nice words about Camp Simcha, of which Sharon and I are presidents, and we've been involved in Camp Simcha for very many, many years. Gabriel was kind to say some words about Camp Simcha, but Camp Simcha, along with many, many other social care charities, have had their resources tested to the limit over the course of this corona period. So if you can turn the page, you'll see that the second thing that we have done, the third thing that we have done, if you count the Jewish Care Campaign, is that we have created a social care assistance fund. So our ambition is to raise somewhere between two and a half and three million pounds. We've raised one and a half million pounds already. And we have received applications from dozens of charities, from charities working from Hackney to Hendon, Liverpool to Leeds and Gantz Hill to Glasgow. And by the way, I'm from Gantz Hill, so I understand that. For those of you who don't know, Gantz Hill's in Ilford. And what we've done is assess those needs and try and understand how much money we are in a position to help them out with because these charities are in desperate need. What, we what I wanted to try and ensure did not happen because I do believe in collaboration is I did not want to see 30 different emergency appeals around the community, whereby in a Darwinian survival of the fittest way, those with the best marketing and the best outreach got the most money rather than those charities that really had dire, desperate need. And we've seen some marvelous, marvelous charities over the course of the last two weeks. We're two thirds of the way through our analysis whereby we have actually begun to understand the way in which charities have engaged with the community over the course of the last 12 weeks and really, really put themselves out. And as you see here, that includes cancer patients, vulnerable children, people with disabilities, victims of domestic abuse, adults experience mental health problems. And as you can see, the numbers are very, very large. So that the increased costs across those applications, we see the direct costs of COVID, to be around 2.6 million pounds. But we also see and expect that the charities will lose income in excess of 6 million pounds. Now, what we've tried to do is be fair and understand the resources and the, uh, the, uh, the, the reserves that the charities have. But what we really need is the community and the, and the community's support in helping us get from that 1.5 million up to the 3 million pounds. So 
just turning to the last page of my short introduction, what we've really tried to do at the JLC is engage where we have seen need and where we have seen real hardship during the course of this COVID period. In social care, in individual hardship, and in the secondary social care charities that so desperately need our help. So in encapsulating what I've tried to talk about tonight, my first part really talks about how we as individuals should be engaging with our community. And my big message in the words of Hillel is, if not now, when? If people are not going to engage with their community at this point in time, they never will. And what we've also tried to do is engage really where the need is most. The JLC was set up to be a federated body on behalf of the major charitable organizations of this community. It's been in existence almost 20 years now. It represents the social welfare charities, the religious, the synagogal charities, education, sport, et cetera, et cetera, and so it goes on. And it believes it has a can-do culture, a culture where things get done, where problems are seen in the community, and where they're identified by our organizations and there's a clear gap, we will seek to step in to help and provide solutions to problems. And there has been no bigger problem in my lifetime than the last three months, both in personal and my heart goes out to other people who have suffered in the same way that we have suffered. I understand what you've been through because we're going through it as well. So in trying to use that spirit of community that I was taught by my parents, by my late father and my mother, by utilizing the great assets that we have in the JLC, I hope that we've been able to make a difference to people's lives over the course of the next three months. But more importantly, I hope that we're able to make a difference going forward to ensure that our social care charities have the resources they need to meet the demands of a community that is in crisis. And without my final plug is there is a web link there at the end of the presentation. And for anybody, however small, thinks they're in a position to be able to help us on that journey, to make your contribution along that journey, then I would ask you to click on that link and make a donation because the community has never ne needed it more. And if not now, then when? Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions, as I say, on the last few months but also on any other issues which you'd like to discuss. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And uh, first and foremost, uh, we wish you, uh, Michael and Daniel, a long life uh, and you're in our thoughts. Um, so I don't think we were expecting that kind of presentation, but we're very thankful for it. Um, and I hope that so we haven't lost too many of our international uh, viewers who might be a bit of lost about what we were saying, but hopefully uh, I'll give more explanation as we go on. Um, if I may uh, ask you a question first, and just a quick reminder uh, to everybody in the room, this is now the opportunity, please, to go into the chat room and um, put your questions to, to Jonathan now, and we will come to you as soon as we can, okay? So please do go into the chat room now and to put your question to Jonathan. Um, Jonathan, um, self-isolation and social distancing have been the antithesis of uh, communal behavior. So how can the public get involved in charity efforts if we're only just emerging from self-isolation? Well, I think the, 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 this evening is a great example of that. I mean, I think there have been some significant benefits. We've learned how to use technology to connect with each other and as an educational tool. Um, I think that many of the communal organizations and I think the synagogues have left, led the way here have used it as an amazing tool to connect with people. Um, but, you know, clearly we are going to have a prolonged period of some level of social distancing, which is going to create great challenges. I think for many of us, the Yamim Naraim, the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is going to be a significant challenge because it seems to me virtually impossible that shores like yours or Norris Lee, where I would govern or many, many shores across the community are going to be able to operate in any way close to what they we, we have become so accustomed to. So I think your question's a difficult one because 
you know, I, I, I am a huge believer in, fit, in personal contact and personal interaction. You know, I, I, I think we all thrive and engage on that personal connection. You know, the point about Zoom is that it operates with only two of our senses. Two of our senses. There are so many, you know, there are others that we're not able to utilize on the Zoom call. So I think your question's a tough one, Gabriel, because we cannot undo the situation that we're in as a country and as a world. And until that, uh, you know, until we found some uh, subsidence and until we have some level of vaccine, I think the communal organizations are going to have to work doubly hard to maintain connection with people in the community and ensure that people feel connected. Um, but obviously I give credit to you and Madeline and, and the rest of your, of, your, of your crew because you've clearly done a wonderful job in doing that for Hampstead Shaw. Well, thank you for saying that. But I think that we exist as a synagogue and we are not really functioning as that. Uh, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. We know that, for example, that the reform movement have said that they will not open their synagogues for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And um, so this, I think, can we say that this is a crisis? Can we say this is an emergency? Because I'm not getting the sense that we're actually understanding what is going on around us at this particular time. Um, and secondly, do you think it's a different type of leader who is emerging at this point who can actually cope much better with the, um, the social, iso uh, social isolation and who perhaps th are thinking very differently than the normative? What that? Yeah, I mean, let me deal with the second part. I mean, le le leadership is, a, is an unusual concept, okay? I, I, I don't regard myself as a leader. I regard myself as someone who gives my time. And if people I enjoy and engage that process, then, then, then it's something which I hope, you know, we can all benefit from. I think that, that, that this period, you know, across the world has shown itself, you know, different leaders have clearly responded in different ways. And, you know, taking the politicians around the entire globe, we can see the vast differences and, and the ways in which, you know, decisions were made early and how that has impacted upon countries. So for me, the thing about leadership for me is, is, is having empathy with the people with whom you operate, the people with whom you interact. Um, having high levels of emotional intelligence so that you understand the issues that are coming around and to try and ensure that you know, issues which you see on a day-to-day -day basis are, are negated as soon as possible. And I think that's why, you know, in the community sense, okay, my, my, my view to Keir Starmer when I met with him was, let's not talk about anti-Semitism or judge you during the corona period. Let's judge you afterwards. Let's first of all focus on the corona and make sure that we're all doing our utmost because we don't want the Jews, Jewish community to be, you know, central to everything at this point in time. So I think leadership is a is an unusual uh, uh, um, um, uh, concept and not something that you should be talking about in terms of yourself. Um, I what was the first part of your question again, Gabriel? Sorry, I can't remember. Let's go. move on because it's much more interesting to take questions from the people in the room. So let's do that. Um, here's a question now. You talked about collaboration and the challenging challenges facing your member charities. Do you see more of our Jewish communal organizations needing to merge in order to keep their services going? So I think that you have to look. Let, let me make a first point. OK, I, I'm, I'm now going into economics in a way. And I will say that on the whole, predictions say more about the person making the prediction than they do about their likelihood of the person making the prediction being correct. So just, just bear that in mind. But it is very, very clear that we are going into a period where great companies have been brought to their knees. And the, the economy of this country is under threat and under challenge. You know, we, we've been lucky so far because the furlough system, which the government so excellently brought in so quickly, together with bank loans and together with bank forbearance of economic situations, means that most companies and individuals as a result have not suffered in the initial period. They've tried to create throw that blanket around the company, around the country. When that blanket is removed, 
you have to assume that the underlying economy is going to get hit. When that underlying economy is going to get hit, then, then the Jewish community's ability to give as generously as it has done historically, you have to believe will be impacted. If that is the case, then you have to look at the plethora of our com communal charities and say, is there a way that we can write this architecture better, more efficiently and more effectively? Now, if that leads to mergers, absolutely, that's fantastic in my view. If that leads to some organizations saying, well, look, you actually do this part better. I'm going to vacate that scene and leave that to you equally as good as well. So I think there are a number of ways. People dread the use of the word merger because it ends up being a battle of wills about who is in charge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think that we're now in an environment where that type of conversation is inevitable. And I think we would be negligent as a community to not address those issues as soon as we can. And in fact, I've convened a meeting, well, sorry, the, the, the chairs will get a notification tomorrow, where a leading economist will be giving a talk to the chairs of all of our organizations, trying to lead a debate and an agenda on that basis, because I think it is inevitable and appropriate that those discussions occur across the community. Thank you for that. And, on, and we've got a question now from Sydney Myers about choices, because of course there's going to be a limited pot. So, uh, Sydney? Yeah. Uh, hi, Johnny. Nice to see you. Um, I want to ask how you prioritise between the immediate needs of the social care charities that you've talked about and, say, educational organisations, longer term needs, because you know, clearly there's the here and now, but there's the future we have to think about as well. Uh, look, uh, hi, Sydney. It's, it's a brilliant question. And Sydney, it's good to see you looking so well. Okay, sure. um, um, it's a brilliant question. OK. And I talk. that's why I framed my comments about connection to the community. OK. I'm an absolute believer that we have a huge obligation to keep ourselves our children, and in some cases, our grandchildren, or maybe even great-grandchildren on this call, connected to our community. I think we have to, first of all, however, deal with the urgent need in our, in our midst. So the short-term requirement, we're talking about very short-term appeals. The Jewish Care Nightingale Fed appeal was a four-week appeal. Our appeal will be a four- to six-week appeal. Also very short, to deal with the immediate need. Education is a very, very challenging subject in terms because it's so broad, okay, just to answer as glibly. But I don't think that education is less important than social care. I just think we're in the middle, quite obviously, of a social care emergency. We're in, we're in a situation where we have been, you know, a muckot has come down on, 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 on our community, on the country and on the world, and we have to react to that because... We have seen too many of our own community suffer. We've seen too many of our own community, unfortunately, pass away. And we have to ensure that we do needs must. You know, it's obviously a big, you know, a, a, a big uh, mitzvah of us to look after, you know, our, our elderly community. You know, we, we pray for it every day. And I think that is the first and foremost obligation we have at the moment. And then I think it is really important, the more people we can get to engage with community, engage with education, the better. But I can tell you, Sydney, and you'll know this, we are short of volunteers in this area, in these areas. And that's why I say, if not now, when? Don't wait until tomorrow. Let's not just keep ourselves with, you know, debates and talking shops, all of which are great for education, but volunteers are what this community needs. You know, I, I once heard a, a shear from Chief Rabbi Sachs when he talked about Korach, and we all know that Korach led a uh, rebellion against you know, the greatest leader in Jewish history. And uh, Chief Rabbi Sachs said, you know, everybody thinks that uh, the message of Korach is that we have, you know, we, too many people want to be leaders of the community. He said, but the truth is we don't have enough followers. And that's the message I've always seen around because it's always the same people you see around the tables 
And it's always, a, you know, often the very small number of people who you see being prepared to volunteer themselves forward. Thank you for that. Um... Am I right that the Jewish Voluntary Network has joined the Jewish Leadership Council? And yes, how will you work with them in future? Well, they're, we're delighted that they've joined us. Unfortunately, uh, they had their own tragedy uh, recently. And I shouldn't, you shouldn't, I don't think I should mention the JBM without mentioning David Lazarus, who unfortunately passed away in recent times. But clearly, this is another way that the JLC is seeking, both through its lead division and through the JBN to reach out to the wider community to ensure that as many people are engaged with their communal organizations as possible. So we will be, they've only just joined in the last two, three weeks, and we will be looking to engage with them further to ensure that we spread the net. Because as I say, you know, I, I'm not a believer in hierarchy. I believe that everybody has their commitment, their, their contribution to make because we are one big team. You know, for those of you, I'll, I'll, I'll go away from Torah and give, for those of you who've watched the Michael Jordan basketball, he's the greatest basketball player ever lived. And yet he didn't win anything until he realized that he was part of a team. And that's what we all need to realize. We are all part of a big, big team. And we've all got our contribution to make, be that through the JBN Gabriel or be that through the JWA, which obviously Madeline has connections to or, or others. We have very many, many organizations which we can connect to. And that, I said in my preface that I don't think it matters how we connect with the community. We can do it through sport, through art, through culture, but find your connection point and engage because you can't wait till tomorrow to do it. But we still have to make decisions. And we've got a question now coming in from Violet Richard. Can we go to Violet Richard, please? Actually, Violet. from uh, uh, Michael Richard. Uh, that's right. That's my mistake. Sorry. That's all right. Um, can I ask the um, collection and appeal that went on recently for the care homes? How were decisions taken to distribute the funds that were collected, please? Okay. So when that fund uh, was decided to be created. There was a conversation between the three organizations, Jewish Care Federation and Nightingale Hammerson. And based upon relative need, they agreed up front a fixed percentage distribution between the three charities. And without wishing to divulge their confidences, because I don't know if it's been made public, obviously Jewish Care was the largest charity of those three. And they took the lion's share. And then broadly speaking, the balance was split equally between the other two. So it was an agreement between the three charities as to how that split. And I think you'll find that all three charities were very happy with the outcome of the appeal as a result. Thank you very much. I'm Can going I to just explain one thing? Because I, 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 so I just want to explain something else, which is that, so we have had, as I've said to you, over 30 applications to the social care fund that we've created. We've created a group which is diverse. In fact, I saw one of our members on the screen, Henry Grimwell, uh, Baroness Ros Altman, Dame Gail Ronson, uh, Sir Mick Davis, people who are experienced in the charity world, um, uh, Hilda Worth, who I think is also a member of your show. Um, and we have, you know, analyzed the need and trying to make allocations fairly and appropriately across the needs of those various charities. So we've all, also tried to deal with it in a scientific and forensic way to ensure that, that money will go where the greatest need is. Thank you very much. I think we're slightly going to change the subject now, and we're going to go over to Malcolm Green. Um, the Middle East always looms large, I think. So, uh, Malcolm, can we get your question, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Hi, Johnny. Um, I'm going to try and put my camera on, if I can. Uh, oh, yes, there we go. Hi. Yes, yeah, so I have a question for you, Johnny. Um, do you think that in the, in the current circumstances, the relationship of support between Israel and the diaspora may be also up for kind of a rethinking? Um, you know, obviously we've heard that, thank God, fantastic. Israel has um, dealt with coronavirus extremely well, has had a low mortality rate, and, you know, it's quite keen to tell us as well about how well they've done. Um, we have suffered. Um, you know, it struck me that had the numbers or the pr proportions of our suffering been reversed, 
we would probably be having maybe a one minute silence on Zoom um, for Israel. And I'm interested whether that actually, this is a moment where we could be supported. We have need at the moment, as, you, as you've said, and as you're actioning in terms of our charity. Yeah. I think it's a, sorry, yeah, hi, Malk. Um, right. So I think it's a really interesting question. And I think you have to step back and say, what is the relationship today between Israel and the diaspora? And there is no doubt that over generations, that is becoming more and more complicated. And there is no doubt that the center of the political world within Israel is different from the center of the political world in many parts of the diaspora. You know, I, I, when I took on the role two years ago, I spent some in one of my summers in Israel. Unfortunately, we're not allowed in at the moment. Um, I, I spent time with a member of the Knesset and who, who was very, you know, Galut focused, diaspora focused. And he said, John, the, at the end of the day, there's 120 members of the Knesset. And in order to get reelected, they need the votes of their local population. And espousing causes in the diaspora, frankly, doesn't win them any votes and in, in tuckless in day to day issues. And I think, unfortunately, that that mentality has spread and is too prevalent in, 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 as a factor between the relationship between Israel and the diaspora. So that I, I worry that when we talk about Am Yisrael Chai, we used to mean the Jewish people live. And I worry that when Am Yisrael Chai is said in Israel, it means the state of Israel lives. And there is now this splinter occurring between diaspora and Jewry and Israeli jury. And I think, you know, without getting involved in, in my opinions about annexation, because I keep away from issue, issues of politics and, and the like, I would say that it's interesting to see how, you know, we, I think the diaspora jury accepts that it just doesn't have a voice anymore in these debates. Israel has a fully fledged, mature political system. And, you know, the Israeli political world will have its say through the cabinet, through the Knesset, and dictate Israel's strategic and security interests. And coming back to your question in that respect, I think in some ways this whole notion of Am Yisrael Chai has not played back in a, in a strong way to uh, Israel's relationship with the diaspora. And I think you're probably right. I think if it was the other way around, we would be far more engaged with the issues then maybe we have seen the other way around. Having said that, and I think I, you, know, you need to understand the balance, I have seen a, a reach out from the Jewish agency, by way of example, under the chairmanship of, of Isaac Herzog, who has made funds available to Jewish community organizations um, if they are in dire need at this point in time on an interest-free loan basis. And that's a very, very helpful and welcoming um, um, aspect, which I don't think is getting the publicity it deserves, because I think it is one of the few occasions that I have seen the reverse situation coming back from Israel to the diaspora. Um, but again, like most questions, Malcolm, most questions you certainly would ask, they delve into complicated issues, which, you know, need careful consideration. But at the heart of it, I have to say, we really, you know, when we grew up, you know, one of my earliest memories was Entebbe, okay? We had those issues of drama where Israel was, was the David to the Goliath and, and our children and grandchildren are, are growing up in an era in which they don't see Israel in the same way. And that's mainly because of the way that it's portrayed in the media and the way in which the geopolitical situation has changed in the Middle East. And we have to work harder to ensure that the emotional attachment of our children to Israel is maintained. And we have to sort of, not get ourselves swayed by, you know, how we would have expected Israel, which is a very complicated democracy and country, to have acted in relation to one or certain issues. Thank you for that. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions on the social media, particularly on Facebook, and they, I think there's a, a remem they're remembering what you said about mergers and wondered whether the time has now come for the Board of Deputies of British Jews and the Jewish Leadership Council to merge. Uh, yeah, well, I, I assume that would be asked at some point in the, in the hour. Look, my, my position is very clear, okay? And my position has always been very clear. It's been clear since, uh, you know, I've worked with, and you know, 
I, I inherited a trustee board, which I was delighted and honored to have Jonathan Arkush on. We work very, very closely and I've worked closely with Marie since she's become president as well. My, my, my position is quite simple. Over the course of the last 30, 40, 50 years, the, the community has changed. And the community is now represented in very, very many ways. And people engage with the community in very, very many ways. You have welfare, you have you know, the chairman of Jewish care and the Jewish care board, and you have, you have uh, security in terms of community security trust, and you have education, you have the synagogal bodies, all of whom now congregate and sit as members of my council at the, at the Jewish Leadership Council. I've always believed that a merger of equals between the Board of Deputies and the Jewish Leadership Council is in the interests of the wider community. But what I wanted to ensure in that process was that the actions that we've taken in the last 12 weeks, which have required, required quick decision making and access to a trustee body and the chairs, would not be lost if we were merely enveloped and subsumed into a wider 300 person plenary. We had to create, in my view, without calling them the House of Commons and the House of Lords, two different fora which had equal authority, one which represented the organizations and one which represented the people. And that, in my view, would create a great dynamic for the community under one trustee board. And my simple theory was you create those two bodies, you have four from the Board of Deputies, four from the JLC, and let the wider body in some form of you know, collegiate vote, elect the chair. And as it happens, I said in the initial conversations, and I state again today, that if that was available tomorrow, I would not put myself up for election. I'm not looking to create some grandiose title for myself. The Board of Deputies had a different view, to be fair to them, and I respect them fully. They have a historical uh, legacy. It's been around for a long time. And their view was that, that just to take the chair of Jewish care, I don't know who your representatives are on the Board of Deputies, Gabriel, but let's say one of your representatives, the, the chairman of Jewish care would have the same representative rights of the Board of Deputies as the member for Hampstead. And I say, and the organizations say, well, we think we would lose the collective power that we're creating for the community, the benefits we're creating for the community, if we were simply subsumed in that way. So a merger of equals, Gabriel, tomorrow. But you know what, let's, let's worry about the corona. Let's worry about what we're doing for the community. The board does great work. Its political representation work is great. Marie is an exceptionally effective president. She's incredibly energetic. Let us focus on where we're benefiting. Hopefully one day we'll wake up and we'll realize that a merger of equals is the right way forward. Until that day, we'll carry on doing our good for the community. I think that, uh, well, as you know, Marie uh, van der Zyl, the president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, was our first speaker in this series. And uh, she was really excited by the, the changes that are ha happening in her institution in so much as Zoom meetings for the first time and allowing deputies to speak from across the country. So there's a very much a transformative process going on. And of course, uh, what she loved the most of it, of course, was being able to mute some of the deputies in discussion. So uh, that's a great power. Um, uh, the Board of Deputies have commissioned a report on racial inclusivity with the community. Is the uh, JLC going to get involved in that? Well, I think, you know, clearly if we were invited to be a participant, then it's something that we would be happy to be involved in. Uh, I think it's an interesting um, move on behalf of the, uh, the Board of Deputies. Uh, I think that clearly the whole issue of race relations has been brought to the fore as a result of the George Floyd murder, which I referred to earlier. I think that um, we have to, I'd be very interested to know who are going to be the members of the commission. I know that it's being chaired by Stephen Bush, who's a very able journalist, uh, but I, I, I think it would be interesting to see who will be members of that commission. Maybe Amanda, who I saw on this call, will, will know. And I think that, but there's a number of questions obviously, which, which headline, that uh, the commission, which I think are very, very pertinent to our community, because I think if we're talking about racial inclusiveness, then clearly, you know, we have some wide issues in our community, one of which obviously relates to, you know, whether or not the Sephardi and those of uh, Middle Eastern origin, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't know whether they're included in the commission or not, 
um, are um, included in that in that definition and whether that's part of the analysis. And, and the second thing I'll say is that, um, you know, the, uh, the definition of what constitutes a Jew, it's also going to be an interesting challenge for that commission. Um, because um, there are, you know, there are many, many people around and uh, we want to, it would have to ensure that it was properly representative and properly represented all the views of people who felt the need to get involved. So I, I, I commend the, the initiative. Uh, I think it's, a, it, it, it's clearly interesting uh, move forward. And I, you know, I, I haven't seen some of the follow on to be able to comment much further, Gabriel. Okay, thank you. Um, the last chance for everybody to put your question to Jonathan. Um, one of the things which I think is preoccupying a lot of people is the cultural area, um, particularly theatre. Um, but we now in our community, of course, have uh, the Jewish Museum and we have Jewish cultural centres. Um, what do you see happening there? Well, I, I was talking to um, um, uh, my friend Jonathan Lewis, who I think is currently the chair of the uh, of the of the Jewish film um, uh, season, and he was telling me that they are arranging the first drive-in for a Jewish movie. Uh, I forget what date it is, um, but it's going to be in the next uh, couple of months. Look, clearly, you know, our cultural events are under challenge at this point in time. The JW3 is closed. Uh, all our cultural venues are closed. The museum, as you rightly mentioned, is closed. And I think we have to work doubly hard at ensuring we remain connected with our community at this point in time. And that's a challenge. That is an absolute challenge. Um, I think, as I've said right at the beginning, I think most of our communal organizations have done that absolutely wonderfully. They have engaged in the most extraordinary way, but nothing replaces uh, physical connectivity. I only hope because we've seen great numbers here. I wonder, Gabriel, if you have invited me to speak at Hampstead Shaw, whether or not so many people would have come as are here or as you say, on watching on Facebook or other channels that you've used. And the same with you know, the other speakers, and I'm sure with your subsequent speakers as well. So somehow or other, we have to garner this spirit, garner this energy that we've created and take it forward into the next generation to in a next time post corona so that we are fully engaged with our community i think that we should be very very proud of our anglo jewish community i think if you go back to the enough is enough campaign and if i can just tell you a little story so shabbos goes out on that saturday night and it was the facebook week of mu the mural and uh, luciana berger had been so brave on the Thursday or the Friday to come out. Uh, you know, she was, you know, clear leading MP and she had a job for life in Wavertree. People should never forget that she gave up her job for life effectively to become, you know, uh, to, to take on the, the might of the Corbyn uh, 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 group within the party. And I spoke to somebody straight after Shabbat and we said, you know what, we really have to do something. And so we decided to go with the Enough is Enough demonstration on the Monday. I think Anglo Jewry should be very proud of itself from that day onwards till today. I'm not saying it shouldn't have been proud before that, but it stood up and it was brave and it made a stand and it created an energy amongst our community. If I look at the way the community has reacted over the course of the last three, four months, I think we should be equally proud. We should be proud that we have an invigorated community that is an example to the world. I spend a lot of time in America, okay? I, my business interests are 50% in America. I was there four times, unfortunately, in January and February to show off and I travel there. And I can tell you that they admire our communal organizations. We might think it's crazy, but they admire our communal architecture. They admire the way we stick together. They admire the fact, they aspire to have the engagement of our young people to their community, to Israel. They aspire to have our assimilation rates, which are terrible, but compared to America, they're unbelievable. So yeah. I think the, 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 the issue for us is to try and capture that engagement. And that's why I started by the individual. 
talking about how do we as individuals, how do I as an individual engage with my community? What did my parents do to engage me and Michael and Daniel? And hopefully I engage my children and so on and so forth. I don't think I'm as good as my parents. But I think that's our job. Our job is to capture this atmosphere, take it on to the next layer, take it on to the next level. But we can only do it by starting from ourselves, by everybody on this call engaging and agreeing to do more. I don't mean financially, I mean in time or in commitment or in an act of chesed, as I said. What I think we've all realized, and then I will finish, the biggest lesson I've learned from being an uncle and the biggest lesson I've learned from Corona is that small acts of kindness mean the world. Now, as the president of Camp Simca, maybe I should have realized that beforehand because that's what typifies it. But maybe it's only been when I've needed it or I've actually been the beneficiary of small acts of kindness that I've understood what that means. And if every single one of us took nothing from this call, other than maybe he talks a bit much, but says, if I'm going to go away and every day from now, I'm going to do one act that I didn't do before. I'm going to phone that person. When I hear that person's got a yurt site, I'm going to make a special point of wishing them long life. I'm going to inquire after that person who's, who's not well or is infirm. If we just did one small act of kindness, because we all know that one small act can change the world. Thank you, Jonathan. That's uh, really a, a beautiful sentiment. Um, and I, I was reflecting on what we were doing at Hampstead, right? Um, and what I think I was trying to do is create channels like this to allow people to come together, because I think that's part of the thing. Uh, we, we're getting like 1,800 people turn up to these meetings. It's, it's phenomenal. We've attracted more Jewish leaders in the last few months than we have probably in the last 20 years, right? There's an engagement and there's a discussion and debate going on. But you're absolutely right. We've got to now to re reinvigorate the community. And in a small way, I think that there's something really very profound going on. We had two meetings on Zoom for our volunteer base, which basically mushroomed out of nothing uh, in the early part of this uh, emergency. And what was so striking was that people liked helping other people and they were they got something a hell out, a lot of that, a lot out of it uh, themselves. So I think I don't want us to return back to the normal that we had once before. I want the community to really get excited and to plan for the future. Um, and I'm I'm worried that we can create the channels, but will that energy happen? I think that, that, that it will. Um, I think we have we still haven't come up with a solution for Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur this year. I think that um, as many people know, uh, many of our community are three times a year Jews who only engage in the, in the synagogue and the community at, at this time of year. And we've got to have something which is exciting and-, and uh, Better three times a year, Gabriel, than never. Yeah, I know, of course. No, I, I'm saying that. But th this year, they won't be able to touch base with the community unless there's something that they can. And so I think we have to be very, very creative. So I'll phone you later and I'll give you an idea that I've got. So we'll okay. look at it. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up. I think it's been a fascinating evening. So I'm going to ask uh, Madeline if she would mind uh, introducing herself. She's been behind the scenes. Uh, finding out where all the questions are. Oh, my goodness. She's like a discombobulated head. Um, floating okay. out of our, our I will remove the background if the background is driving you oh, mad. Fine, fine, fine. Um, the background is a mixture of Hampstead Synagogue and my bookcase, so a bit of a mixture. Um, Jonathan, thank you very much. I loved the way you started with the quotes from Hillel and added with and ended with the small acts of kindness, which I think are absolutely right. Um, so we go from giving of ourselves in a big way, joining community, or just phoning your neighbor. Whatever you do um, is worth doing. And for you as chair of the JLC to say that is fantastic. The JLC includes so many different charities. I've only recently got involved and very impressed at what it's trying to do in bringing these charities together, in trying to make sure that we work from a common front and that you as the JLC can help us 
by collecting on a communal front, which I think collecting the money financially for the homes and then for the social care charities without, as you said, everybody doing their own thing and survival of the fittest is very important. So thank you. Um, thank you for tonight. We hope that one day we can invite you to the real Hampstead Synagogue, though, as Gabriel has already said, we may well not have uh, the same audience size. Zoom has been absolutely amazing in that. Um, but we want to invite you to our next event. And our next event is in two weeks on Tuesday, the 30th of June, when um, slightly different format, we will have a panel of three speakers. Um, Naomi Dixon, who is the CEO of Jewish Women's Aid. That's hardly surprising that we've involved her as I'm chair of Jewish Women's Aid. Also, Laurie Ratkind, who is the CEO of Jamie, and um, Rachel Karp, who is a circuit judge in the family law courts. And the purpose of having these three people together is for us to look at what has happened inside the Jewish home and in the wider community over the period of COVID. Most of us who are present tonight come from privileged backgrounds. We live in wonderful houses with gardens, if we're lucky, with access to outside space. What about the people not in that situation? And a lot of our community is, is in trouble and these people can answer your questions and tell us what's going on in the areas that have suffered much more than we have over COVID. So we look forward to welcoming you at eight o'clock on 30th of June. And thank you again, Jonathan, for joining us tonight. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Very much.